So Dr. Ogden, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Hello again. Today we're talking about something you're a specialist in, which is the dragon in antiquity and in the medieval period. But when we hear the word dragon in this day and age, we immediately jump to modern conceptions. As you argue in the book, the ancients had something quite different in mind. So how was the dragon understood in antiquity? What were its primary characteristics? Right. So when I talk about dragons in the ancient world, I'm focusing primarily on the word that's actually at the root of our word dragon, which is ultimately the Greek dracon. The Romans borrowed that as draco. They had their own word serpens, which gives a serpent, of course. And from draco, the medieval French developed dragon, and we took that over. So I am, as in a strict etymological sense, talking about you know what is at the root of our dragon in that way. And for the Greeks, so a dracon had quite a broad meaning. And after much worrying about this very elusive term, the way I've come to define it in short compass is basically a snake and something more. Okay, so there's a very wide spectrum. So the standard ancient Greek dracon was basically a massive snake of some sort. At the sort of fantastical end of the scale, it could be, I mean, a really massive serpent, you know, capable of swallowing a man, uh, hundreds of feet long. But at the other end of the scale, it could be, again, a very large serpent, but a real serpent, for example, of the sort that would be kept in the sanctuaries of healing gods like Asclepius. I mean, the extra dimension there would be a certain sacredness. When I say plus, so again, think about the fantastical dragons. Of course, they have sort of extra qualities in terms of their behavior. In terms of that, because projecting fire, more often incidentally from their eyes than from their mouths in antiquity as it happens. But they could also have extra body parts. Many dragons had little beards, interestingly. We see that in art, not so much referred to in literature, but in, in the art, they often have little beards. Sometimes they had multi-heads. So again, the hydra is a dragon with many heads. But they could often be compounded with different animal parts you know, to create sort of new monsters, like the chimera, for example, which is part lion, part goat, and part as a dragon. So it was possible in the real world to meet a real dragon, I would say, in the relatively safe and reassuring environment of the healing sanctuary. And we don't know for sure. Ancient descriptions are not accurate enough, and the ancients didn't classify snakes to our criteria. But probably the snakes that they used as it were, in these temples, it would have been four-lined snakes, Lafer, Quattro, Lineata, which are large snakes, but they're not poisonous, and they're quite placid creatures. They don't really mind being mauled by people. So for the ancients, dragons really did exist because of that real end of the spectrum. What are some of the earliest examples of dragons in Greek lore and art? Well, it's difficult to date Greek myths. You know, we can talk about the earliest point of attestation, but seldom is there any reason to think that the earliest attestation has anything to do with that point of invention. So all the big dragons of Greek myth, probably just to a certain extent, are effectively of the same age, or at least they were already established, as it were, before, as it were, we had access to historical Greek culture in the 8th century BC. I mean, the famous ones were Python at Delphi, the dragon of Ares, which protected a sacred spring at Thebes and was thought by Cadmus. So Python at Delphi was fought by the god Apollo. The dragon of Colchis, fought by Jason. Laden, the dragon of the Hesperides, fought by Heracles. The Hydra, I've already mentioned, also fought by Heracles. But again, these you know were probably well established long before Greek literature starts for us, or Greek art for that matter, is pretty much starts for us. The one I haven't mentioned yet, and the one we can sort of be sure is super old, is the myth of Typhon. So Typhon was fought by Zeus. Now, Typhon, as first described for us in Hesiod, and as we see him on the pots, um, is not a pure dragon or dracone. On the pots, he's basically what we call an angry ped, which is to say that he has a, a snaky bottom half, a snake tail, but a humanoid torso, often wings as well. In Hesiod, the description of him is much more complex and sort of physically impossible, but that's clearly the form in which he was normally conceptualized in early Greece. And he fought Zeus for control of heaven and lost. And again, in, in Hesiod's description of the great battle, we have fire against fire. That's a common theme in ancient dragon fights. So the fieriness of Typhon goes up against the fiery thunderbolt of Zeus, and, and Zeus wins. In different versions of the myth, he has different ends. But the most, in the most famous 
end. He can't be destroyed, but he's buried by Zeus under Mount Etna in Sicily. And the fire that still belches forth from the volcano is a remnant of that fight. And the ancients themselves couldn't decide whether that fire was Typhon's own fire that he was, uh, again, belching forth in his anger from his trapped state in the underworld, or, or whether these were, this were still the sort of the fiery, smoking remnants of Zeus's thunderbolts. And the reason we know that that's a particular ancient myth is because it's basically an example of a widespread Near Eastern myth type, which we find in many of the famous ancient Near Eastern languages, you know, Sumerian, Akkadian, Hittite, Egyptian, Hebrew. So this is what we call the combat myth, you know, lots of examples of that. So it was clearly a widespread myth type in the Near East. Um, there are many Indo-European examples, including Norse. Again, again, we get the Norse version is Thor against the Midgard worm. So it, it does seem because of the nature and spread of the Indo-European examples that the myth would have existed, as it were, before the Indo-European languages diverged. So that in itself would indicate that the myth existed in the middle of the fourth millennium BC, in the Indo-European homeland, which is normally considered to be so the, the Russian step to, to the, the eastern side of the Black Sea, somewhere like that. But again, the Near Eastern version are attested from the third millennium, second millennium BC. So yeah, there's good reason for thinking that that's a very, very ancient myth indeed. And presumably, although the Greek version would have been influenced, in fact, we can demonstrate that it was influenced really by Near Eastern versions, the fundamental core myth would presumably have been inherited, as it were, vertically, you know, from, again, the speakers of the original Indo-European language. So that's pretty old. This year, I'm going through the works of Martin L. West. Oh, um, yes. His work on the Iliad and the Odyssey, and cool. very interesting, just all these tales. I mean, we can't obviously prove genetic links, but it's obviously the core story is there, like you were talking about. I think in... The version yeah. I'm most familiar with from Pseudo Apollodorus, that story is very much like Baal slaying the the sea serpent, you know, well, very much. Yeah, yeah. 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 One figure that the Dracon is associated with, just getting back to the Near Eastern parallels, is the Lamia. So I didn't know if you could talk about their relationship to the dragons for a bit. Lamia is a very complex, elusive phenomenon. So she's a demoness with different bits of myth associated with myths of different sorts. There are stories attaching to, as it were, a single Lamia creature or a person, even, in origin. But then there are many traditions in which uh, there, uh, a, Lamia is a, a Lamia, Lamia is a class of demon, class of being. What does seem clear is that she's fundamentally inherited from Mesopotamian demoness Lamashtu, the link between the, with the name is very clear. Alongside Lamia, there were, there were similar demons like Gallo, and again, they have Mesopotamian antecedents like um, Galu. So, I mean, I think that makes it pretty clear, the channel of travel there, I think. Whether the Greeks had demons like Lamia before they borrowed the name Lamia, we can't tell. But one of the things that is noteworthy about Lamia from Mesopotamian sources, again, we're about second millennium BC, is that she has a snake element or she's associated with snakes. So that element is really there from the start, even though it's not always apparent or foregrounded in the Greek version of Lamia. But it is sometimes. The single most famous Lamia episode is in Philostratus, his early 3rd century AD biography of Apollonius of Tyana. One of his pupils is seduced by this beautiful Phoenician woman, this is in Corinth, who appears out of nowhere She's very rich, and in no time at all, she's persuaded him to marry her. And Apollonius turns up uninvited at the wedding, and in the course of the festivities, he says, look, all these splendid decorations around the hall, that they don't exist, they're just hallucinatory. And you yourself, he says to his people, are warming a snake on your bosom. Now, in English, that's sort of like an established metaphor, really, a clasping snake to one's bosom. But that isn't a metaphor in, in ancient Greek. He, he means it literally, meaning the woman that you are cuddling is actually a snake. She is actually a And so she's sort of unmasked, and she confesses at that point that she's had this plan to feed him fat so that she would eat him. And we don't actually hear what happens to her, but we assume it's sort of an exorcistic moment. So presumably she's banished as, as demons are when they're exorcised. It was also suggested, interestingly, that, well, maybe she didn't 
love her victim as such, but she certainly did feel genuine erotic desire for him. So there's, there's a nice tension there. So that's, again, that's a rather striking example of a Lamia. Other examples, well, um, Statius has a superb description of a Lamia. I should say that Lamias are normally conceived of as, well, they normally were child-killing demons, baby-killing demons, but they did also have a taste for handsome young men, oddly. In the work of Bill Hansen, he emphasizes that there's the Lamia, then there's the Empusa. Empusa, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, they're identified by Philostratus. He, he treats them as alternative terms. So the Stacey is Lamia, who, whom we see actually pursuing babies, which described wonderfully, saying she's a good angry pet. I mean, just to go back to Philostratus, we don't know exactly what the relationship between the woman and the snake is. There, That's less obscure. It could be that she's an angry pet. So she's a beautiful woman from the waist up, and she hides her snaky bottom half beneath her skirts, I guess. It could be that she just has the power of transformation, you know, that she can. She is basically a, a snake that can manifest herself in humanoid form. Who knows? It could be that she's a snake, but that her humanoid form is a hallucination that she projects, just like the trappings of her wonderful wedding hall. Who knows? The status is, is, is easier to pin down. So she is an angry pet, so she has the form of a, a woman above the waist, a snaky tail, but she also has a snake head growing out of the top of her human head. And she also has claws, claws with talons. And when we first encounter her, she's sort of crawling along with dead babies hanging from her talons, speared on her talons. So that's quite a striking image. Then we have some wonderful description of Lamia's in Diochrysostom. Again, they're more, described more as a sort of natural phenomenon, like a weird wild animal. And these live in Libya. Again, how do I begin to describe them? They're fundamentally giant snakes with again, with massive snake heads. And they have talons, just like Stasius Islamia, but their tail is in the form of the torso of a, of a naked young woman. And what they do is they hide behind sand dunes. And when attractive young men are coming along, they wiggle their tail up above the sand dune. And of course, the young men just run <laughs> run towards the tail, uh, whereupon the business end of the Lamia wheels around, grabs them in the claws and devours them. So again, three rather different creatures there, three rather different stories, but again, they s- seem to belong together somehow. You emphasized earlier in your introduction, the serpent cult. These are some of the most well-known dragons in antiquity. So let's discuss them for a bit. What was the importance of the serpent cult in the ancient Greek world? The Cults with serpents at their heart are paradoxical, or serpent gods, I should say, at their heart are paradoxical. You expect, as a word, the dracon, and again, they would have used the word dracon in this context as well. You expect dracon to be fierce, to be bad, to be a negative energy, shall we say. And in fact, they were entirely the opposite. I mean, you never knew where you were with the regular Greek gods. I mean, if you read the Hippolytus, you know, you get in trouble with Aphrodite just because you're trying to be nice to Artemis, you know. So they're, they're a dodgy lot. They're an unre- unreliable, unpredictable lot. The serpent gods were an exception in that they were consistently sweet and pleasant and nice and decent. <laughs> okay, so that's quite a paradox. I'm talking principally about the Greek world now. I mean, the Romans did borrow aspects of this stuff, especially Asclepius. So they fell into two broad categories. One is healing gods, and the other is gods of good luck and good fortune and wealth. So to talk about Asclepius first, I mean, who knows how long he had this serpentine aspect. It's first detectable towards the end of the 5th century BC, and he has this association with the snake. And of course, it becomes his symbol. Your viewers may be familiar with you know, the, the traditional iconography of Asclepius with the snake. It's a dracone, a small dracone, winding around his staff. But he himself could manifest himself in the form of a huge dracone. So there's a wonderful description in Ovid, in the Metamorphoses, of the transfer of his cult from Epidaurus, its principal home, to Rome. And this is in the 3rd century BC, around about there, when the Romans had a plague and wanted to import the god to heal that plague. So the Roman ambassadors turn up in his temple in Epidaurus, and he manifests himself before them in the form of a gigantic dracone, again, rampant, rearing up, as they usually do in, in Greek art, but also bowing sort of courteously to the ambassadors. And he demonstrates his willingness to come back to Rome with them by just slithering down to the port and getting on board their boat. 
and they sail back with him. And when they get back, when they're sailing up the Tiber and back into Rome, as they're sailing past the Tiber Island, he chooses that for his spot. So the snake slithers off onto the island and disappears. And that evermore is the sort of the sacred island of Asclepius, and that's where his sanctuary is. And I believe even still today, it's a hospital, in fact, uh, there. I just love the story that it's told of the serpents just kind of looking around. Yes. Kind of sadly saying goodbye to his homeland. You emphasize that, yeah, in the story, it's, it almost seems like he's steering the ship. I'm, yeah, I'm that's reminded right. of Daphnis and Chloe when the, the dolphins start s- steering the ship of the Greek they kidnap Daphnis. Dionysus sends them a dream and all his dolphins, and then they get on the ship and they start steering it. It's the same thing like Asclepius is steering yeah. the ship. And again, the story, the Dracula is very humanized. Yeah, as you say, he regrets leaving Epidaurus, although, of course, he doesn't leave it. He leaves it, and yet he stays there as well. It's not like the Epidaurus closes down or the snake is gone. The snake is still there. It's just a, a sort of a strange sort of method of reduplication or sort of like asexual reproduction or something. <laughs> a new snake is produced, as it were, out of the old one. You know, so when you look at the iconography of Asclepius, you know, it's not entirely clear. And I don't think the Greeks or the Romans themselves ever really decided what the relationship between the god and the dracon was. I mean, yes, in some ways it was the, the god's pet. And we hear, you know, sacred snakes being talked of as being god's pets. It was a symbol. Yeah, it was his avatar. But in other ways, he was a snake. And you, you might say that was his true form, his base form, unless he just manifested himself in humanoid form you know, for the benefit of his his human clients, you know. So when I say that these gods were very swell, obviously he was a healing god, so they expect him to be a sweet god. But, you know, nothing mean whatsoever is ever associated with Asclepius. The nearest thing to a mean thing is recorded in in the miracle inscriptions at Epidaurus, which is a mainly 4th century text where people sort of inscribed as a tribute to the god, the healing that he'd given them. And one chart basically tells the story that he'd incubated the temple in order to receive the god's healing, and had been cured. But then he'd gone around saying, oh, it wasn't the god that healed me, I just got better anyway. Whereupon Asclepius restored the disease, whatever it was, <laughs> and he had to come back again and do it again. And that time he was grateful, and he did acknowledge that Asclepius was the guy that had healed him. As far as I know, that's the meanest thing that Asclepius ever did. But there were other healing gods who were sort of associated with snakes in the same way, like Amphiraeus, and to a certain extent probably Trophonius, so, and you might ask, well, why would they be associated with snakes at all? It's a good question, and not one to which there's a simple or, or single answer. I mean, you might look to the fact that the snake sloughs its skin and sort of comes out fresh again. So it, it almost seems to be a sort of symbol of the renewal of life in itself. Another way of looking at it is just that if we look at the horizon of folklore, I don't mean just within antiquity, I mean as a whole, there is a strong association in international universal folklore between snakes and healing. So if you, if you go to the standard catalogue of the eight, so-called ATU catalogue, you, know, you can find quite a few examples of this, of the, the healing power of the snake there. So probably, as I were, that association is bigger than just Greece and is older than just Greece. So the other category of serpent gods, dracon gods, they are gods that bestow wealth or good luck. And the two most famous ones there are Zeus Melikios, which means Zeus the Propitiated, and Agathos Daimon, or Agatha Daimon, who became particular prominence in Ptolemaic Egypt. He became a patron deity, in fact, of Ptolemaic Alexandria. He did, we can tell, just about exist in the old Greek world before that. And Zeus Melikios I particularly like. Again, we don't really have stories associated with him, but we have a superb set of stelae, dedicated to him, from Athens and the Piraeus in particular. Um, and these engravings show, so in tiny figures, a little nuclear family, a man and a wife and two children, and towering over them is this massive rampant serpent. And, you know, if you if you look at this without context, you tell, oh, my God, that massive serpent is going to eat the people. You know, but no, it's the opposite of that. The family is paying tribute to the great serpent that has made them rich, or has brought them good luck. And uh, again, you might say, well, why would you associate snakes with wealth or good luck? Well, I think the explanation for that is a phenomenon that used to be widespread in the old world, not in Britain, I think, because we've never really had snakes to speak of in Britain, but the house snake. And that is a snake that you encourage actually to live in or underneath 
your house, especially your storeroom, in order to keep the mice away from your stores, especially your grain stores. And so in that way, as it were, the preservation of your wealth and your luck is associated, as it were, with the snake. So yes, there's those separate reasons. Uh, we do have the, these dracon-based gods who are really rather positive forces. Just getting back to our first conversation about necromancy, in the serpent cults, uh, often these snakes are encountered by the person propitiating for healing in the process of incubation. Yeah, I should unpack that term. So by incubation, you basically sleep the night in the temple or an associated building. And things might be going on in the real world around you, but the God will visit you in your dreams and bestow some healing on you there. I mean, I mentioned Amphiraeus as a sort of another sort of healing God like Asclepius. And there's a wonderful plaque that's been dedicated again by a grateful patient, which has several planes of images on it two of these images are sort of parallel with each other. So in one of them, patient is visited by the god in humanoid form, and the god is you know, supernaturally large, bigger than, as it were, a normal human would be. But he's tending to his shoulder, so something wrong with the shoulder. And then in the second plane, we have the same man, the same patient, lying in bed, so presumably incubating in Amphiaresis, uh, Temporis Stoa, and the sacred snake is looping up over his shoulder and applying its mouth to him so either giving him a gentle nip or possibly just sort of licking him it's hard to tell which but those actions are clearly parallel so probably the notion was that as the temple staff would have applied the snake to the shoulder to give the chap a bit of a lick or a nip so in his dreams he would have seen as it were the god maybe in, in humanoid form it's worth thinking here about aristophanes's Comedy, The Wealth, where we have a wonderful scene in what would at the time have been the brand new Temple of Asclepius in Athens. It, was only, it had only just been founded, again, just reported from Epidaurus, as, as the Romans were later to do. So the, the story of that play is that, uh, again, the hero is disgusted with the fact that wealth is blind and therefore associates with all the wrong people. And so he hatches this plan to take, in other words, the personified god wealth to the sanctuary of Asclepius to heal his blindness so that he can see what he's doing and associate with all the right people instead. And so we have this central scene in the sanctuary. And the implications of that scene, again, if I can sort of summarise and analyse a bit together, are, I think, that the nightly round of the incubators, the incubating people, as it were, in a temple like that, would have been as follows. So probably what we would call the medical doctors, the scientific doctors, the Hippocratic doctors, would have done their rounds and tended to them, and in their wake would follow the temple staff wielding the sacred snakes in order to apply a little lick. So in, in Aristophanes' versions, that role is taken on by Asclepius' daughters, and they put a cloth over the patient, and they allow the snake to do its work underneath the cloth. You know, Interesting, again, that their daughters are female, and again, associated with Asclepius in his iconography, Everywhere is Hygieia, you know, on one level, she's just the personification of health. That's what her name means. She has no myth of her own at all. Whereas Asclepius has a snake running around his staff, she holds a snake which drinks from a fiole, from a shallow bowl that she's offering it. I do wonder whether, in fact, the wranglers of snakes, looking at the, the Aristophanes and looking at Hygieia and her iconography, I do wonder whether the wranglers of snakes were typically, in fact, female. So again, maybe again the male doctors would have gone around with their science, and then they'd have been followed by the, as it were, the female temple staff who would have applied the snakes. So you, you know, you got both the the scientific hit and the you know the religious, the sacred hit in sequence. So let's talk about Roman dragons for a bit. Just like declamations are not technically the same in Roman or Greek education. <laughs> They both have their own little specificities. So the Roman dragons. Again, it's, it's, it's a paradox of ancient dragon myths that the best and most detailed and most over-the-top tellings of the dragon myths, again, thinking primarily about the dragon fights now, but also, again, we mentioned the Sleepius and, again, the obvious very detailed narrative of this cult transfer. They're preserved for us in Roman sources. So the Romans clearly loved dragons they really couldn't get enough of those stories but the paradox is that they didn't invent dragons for themselves 
I mean, maybe this is part of the wider problem of why the Romans don't seem to have any myth <laughs> to speak of. You know, it's number one, Romulus and Remus, uh, that's it, really. You know, <laughs> so the, there's one, and this is quite a striking exception to this rule, but the setting of it is very historical, historicized, I should say, and that's the Begrada dragon. So this story is set during the First Punic War, again, in Libya, in North Africa, and this is the dragon strongly associated with the river Bagrada, and therefore called the Bagrada dragon, a massive dragon, hundreds of feet long, which basically lays into Regulus's Roman army there. And they eventually do defeat it using their newfangled catapults. The Romans had only just got their hands on catapults, which they'd sort of you know, taken from you know, the Hellenistic kings, they like, using catapults into their warfare. And with these newfangled weapons, they managed to defeat defeat the dragon i like to think of it as the equivalent of a sort of you know like a 50s b movie or whatever you know in which the usa uses its uh nuclear weapons to defeat the space alien you know it's that that's all, that's absolutely that's all, you know but the dragon was the friend the pet of the nymphs of the river the naiads of the river Bagrada, and they as because he because regulus has killed it they pronounce a curse upon him and so he eventually comes to a grisly end because he killed the dragon. So that's the only really sort of new dragon story that the Romans invent. As I say, they give us really nice, detailed versions of the traditional Greek myths in which they invest the dragon with a lot of personality. You know, the Greek tellings don't have much interest in the psychology of the dragon. It's just there. But the, the Roman narratives are much more interested in the dragon's metal. You know, they see it much more as a sort of creature with a perspective and a point of view and aims and objectives and aspirations. One of my favorite dragon stories from the Roman literary tradition is from Apuleius's Golden Ass, actually, the, oh, the book sure. where after Carite and her husband are murdered, their slaves take off. It's a wonderful, scary story about how they're going through this really gloomy, dark, haunted house kind of area, and they're being like confronted by wolves. And, and one of the sections is with this old man who's like, my son's over here, can you come help me? And then the guy goes with him, he disappears, and then they go f- look for him. And then it's like a giant snake oh, yeah. just ate him. So that's a great story. I mean, what's so good about that, of course, is that Apuleius doesn't quite tell us that the old man and the dragon are the same. Again, the dragon has disguised itself in this humanoid form. But he gives it this hint, doesn't it? Because again, so he's a large old man and a large snake, and he drags his foot. So there's that sort of slithering gait, you know, so that little clue there. You just have to read that story to appreciate it, really. It's all in the telling, isn't it? Here. I think everybody just needs to read The Golden Ass. People don't read The oh, Golden sure. Ass enough nowadays. And just getting back to the Bagrada's dragon real quick before we move on. I love how getting back to my discussion with William Hansen about Flagon of Trolleys, how, oh, yes. you know, if you find something strange, you send it to the king, you send it to the emperor. So they send the skin of the dragon, the snake, back to Rome. You know, as yeah, a curiosity. Sure. Absolutely, yes. And that was indeed the fate of, as you say, the skin of the Bagrada dragon. Similarly, they managed to send, I think, the bones of the sea monster of Ethiopia, the, the Andromeda sea monster, Perseus killed. Those bones at one point were sent to Rome, and yet somehow the locals managed to acquire another set to keep themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course. And a sidebar there. One of the things that I find thrilling, and I don't know if you know Adrian Mayor's book, The First Fossil Hunters, you can find in there the details of, again, the fossil head of some megafauna. I'm not sure whether it was a Miocene giraffe, it might be something like that. But anyway, the fossil, a massive fossil head, was discovered in the ruins of the Temple of Hera in Samos. So the ancient Greeks found this and, you know, said, wow, clearly. <laughs> and whether they thought it was of sacred significance, I don't know because temples sort of served as sort of all-purpose museums, really, in the ancient world. But clearly, they were saying, this is a monster. This is a monster that really existed, you know, and it's special and it's interesting. And trying to think yourself back into, again, an ancient Greek context, how would you explain the discovery of a fossil like that to yourselves? What what would you think it was? Absolutely. That's something that came up. And my discussion about Phlegon as well, you know, you find these giant bones and your mythology, your lore, your art fills in the blanks for you about what these things could have been. The dragon sees a shift as we get into late antiquity with the dawn of apocryphal axe literature. So how did this conception of the dragon change as it found itself the new antagonist of axe and apocryphal literature? And it 
carries over into the medieval period with the dragon yeah. slayer tales. So tell us about this change. So dragons evolved in their degree of badness, if I can put it crudely, and in their physical form. Okay. What makes a big difference, of course, is the Bible, because the Bible is full of bad serpents. I mean, the serpent of Eden, Leviathan, and of course, the, uh, the Revelation dragon. So once dragons come into Christianity, you know, they have a really bad rap, and we can start talking about them as evil. It's hard to say that any ancient Greek pagan dragon was evil as such. It's always a dodgy word, isn't it? Most often, you know, they're basically just fierce animals looking after their own interests or, you know, guarding things for gods, you know, like guard dogs, you know. So they, they're not really bad as such. You know, they become embodiments of evil with that biblical input. In terms of form, they evolve in interesting ways. So already in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, so this is being made in 3rd, 2nd century BC at Alexandria. The translators, you know, many hands, no doubt, they represent Leviathan interchangeably as a dracon and a sea monster. The Greek word for sea monster is kertos, gives us cetus, cetacean, things like that. But the Greek sea monster had a very distinctive body shape. So it had a sort of animalian head, a long neck, a fatter body, it had four flippers, which sometimes became four legs and a twisty serpentine tail, which would end in a fish tail because it was a sea monster. Maybe your re readers can already see in that description the elements of the body shape of our modern dragon. Again, animalian head, fatter body, etc. And so from the Septuagint onwards, in Judeo-Christian thought, dracones and sea monsters become merged together. So that's how the dragon develops its body shape. It basically gets them from the ancient sea monster. I should say that when you show children certain pictures of ancient sea monsters, they say, and fighting sea monsters, not into a contest, they say, that's a dragon. It's already there in a sense, that body shape. Of course, they needed wings as well. Where did they get their wings from? Well, they got that from being identified with humanoid winged demons, winged flying demons, which were already flourishing in the Christian imagination. We know from about 200 AD, at least, they're in Tertullian. Often in many of the early dragon fights, or indeed throughout the whole thousand-year-odd history of saintly dragon fights, dragons are often subjected to exorcism. Again, they are demonic. They are demons in their own right. And so they, they often can't be killed. And so we do get that sort of natural merging between, as well, the winged demon and the dracone. And that's where it gets its wings from. That's a very short version of the classical dragon, which was basically just a big snake, fiery big snake became the creature we know and love. In terms of sort of medieval heroes fighting dragons, well, you've got uh, St. George, of course, so famously fighting his dragon. But it should be said that in terms of saintly dragon fights, that's quite anomalous. He's a martial saint, a military saint, and so he, he does use his sword or his lance. And there's one other saint who does the same sort of thing called uh, Theodore Tyrann. But basically all the other saints who fight dragons, and then there's, there's endless, endless numbers of them. They usually do it just in a very sort of hands-off way, They just with a prayer. They tell the dragon to die, you know, in God's name or whatever, or they send it away in God's name. Uh, and because it's a non-contact sport usually, of course, that means that women can get involved in dragon fighting as well. I we'll have a few female saints who, who can fight dragons too. In terms of what you might call the modern sort of idea of the medieval hero against the dragon, St. George of Park, I suppose we're looking more towards Norse culture or Germanic culture, Siegfried stroke Sigurd against Fafner, things like that, because of Beowulf and his dragon as well. I mean, there's loads of dragon fights in Germanic literature, endless again. But just to try to characterize that, it does seem that, again, the Germanic myths, Germanic stories inherited a sort of worm-like dragon, basically a non-winged land-based dragon, and then sort of imported, probably from Latin hagiographical literature, a winged dragon. It's a bit of a complicated story, but probably that's what's going on. Or at least maybe not hagiographical writing so much as other Christian writing. They imported a wing-based dragon. And often these things are sort of side by side in the texts. So the Germanic word for dragon is basically worm or ormer or wurm. Beside that, they have words derived from from Dracone on the Latin Draco. So we have Anglo Saxon Draca and Norse Drecke and German Traca, things like that. Sometimes 
these two creatures are the same. Sometimes they're contrasted with each other. Again, sometimes these things get mixed up in interesting ways in their stories. So, for example, if you take the Beowulf dragon, which is, I suppose, the earliest properly tested Germanic dragon, I mean, the, the, the big dragon at the end of Beowulf, not the reference to the Fafner earlier on. We're told that this is a marauding dragon. It flies, it, it spits down fire and, you know, sets fire to the hall and everything. But in the final battle against Beowulf, it never leaves the ground, oddly. And all it needed to do was hover 10 feet in the air and it had won, you know. So it seems that we have two different sort of dragon paradigms fighting it out there within Beowulf. You get the sense of an ancient story of a ground-based dragon with a newfangled fancy flying dragon sort of half-heartedly integrated. And you get that impression in a number of those medieval German texts as well, that they haven't quite decided on what type of dragon they're dealing with. This has been such a pleasure. It's always awesome getting to talk to you about werewolves and dragons and dead people. It's amazing. So thank you so much for being so generous with your time and knowledge. And until next time, you have a great morning. See you now.